Levinson, and welcome to Light On, Light Through, episode 82. Kojo Namdi interviews me on his NPR radio show. I went down to Washington, D.C. in September 2009 and was treated to one of the best interviews I've ever had about new new media. In fact, one of the best interviews, period. And this was by Kojo Namdi on the Kojo Namdi Show, an NPR show. It's a great show. It was part of his Tech Tuesday show. The interview is about, oh, 40 minutes in length, and I've wanted to put this up here on Light On, Light Through for a while. We cover Twitter, YouTube, and a really nice aspect of this interview are the emails and tweets and phone calls that I took during the interview. So here it is. Enjoy. From WAMU 88.5 at American University in Washington, welcome to the Kojo Namdi Show, connecting your neighborhood with the world. It's Tech Tuesday. You wake up, you update your Facebook page, you Twitter about the day ahead, about the line at Starbucks, about delays on the metro. You get to work and you cruise the headlines online and offer your own commentaries on the day's news in the blogosphere. Welcome to the era of new, new media. Not to be confused with the era of new media. iTunes and Amazon.com are so three years ago. No, we're in the midst of something newer than that, or so says Paul Levinson. He's been studying and writing about the next big thing in media and society for over 30 years when the facsimile was cutting edge. Today, he has no fewer than four blogs, an active Twitter feed, and multiple podcasts. But he says we're suffering from information underload, not yet living up to the possibilities of new technological horizons. Paul Levinson joins us in the studio. He's a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University and author most recently of New New Media. Paul, good to see you again. Well, delighted to be here, Kojo. Of course, you may be familiar with some of Paul Levinson's past works. They include Digital McLuhan and Cell Phone, the story of the world's most mobile medium and how it has transformed everything. He's also an award-winning science fiction writer. His latest work of fiction is The Plot to Save Socrates. Paul, five years ago, if we were talking about cutting-edge media, the words Facebook, Twitter, YouTube wouldn't have been in the conversation. Today we're talking about something you call new, new media. You can see the political impact just when you think about the election of 2004 and compare it to the election of 2008. Back in 2004, Howard Dean was known as the Internet Candidate, (laughs) but his Internet had no YouTube, had no Twitter. Facebook was just an infant, uh, a, a tiny sliver of its current size. There were bloggers back then. But after all was said and done, his campaign failed. His Internet support did not translate into the general population. In contrast, Obama's Internet campaign was immensely successful. And people could see him on YouTube. His supporters could tweet about what was going on at campaign rallies. And that was one of the things that did make a difference in 2008. Now, the crucial difference between these current new, new media, as I call them, and now the old new media is that consumers can instantly become producers. That's profoundly democratic with a small d, even though it helped the Democratic Party with a big d. And that's the difference between the Howard Dean campaign in 2004 and the Obama campaign in 2008 in terms of the difference between old new media and new new media? Yes, that's the difference. One of the other signal characteristics is you mentioned iTunes and Amazon. They, of course, both exist on the web. There's a little opportunity for consumers to become producers uh, insofar as they can comment on songs and uh, books that are available on Amazon. 
but they have to pay for what they download and what they might buy on Amazon. In contrast, new new media are free. And as David Carr wrote in the New York Times a few years ago, one of the first to recognize this trend, only suckers pay for content nowadays. Yes, David Carr is an old friend of ours, of course. As we sit here, it occurs to me we're talking about a book which is one of the oldest of the old media. The book, of course, is Paul Levinson's called New New Media. We're on the radio. Old media, people can listen and respond via new media through Internet streaming and email. And we're on Facebook and Twitter, which are new new media. So all of these things can coexist. Just as organisms from all ages coexist and flourish in the biological world. And this is a common misconception that a lot of people have. It is true that sometimes uh, something like silent movies are totally replaced by talkies, or hieroglyphics were, for the most part, replaced by alphabetic writing. But most of the time, old media continue if they perform a useful service. So books still perform a useful service. They have what I call reliable locatability, meaning if you look at my book and you look at something on page 30 and that's significant to you and you put my book in a safe place, it will be in that place on page 30 next month, next year, a decade from now. In contrast, even with permalinks online, you never know that something will be where you expect it to be when you look online. And radio still has the wonderful advantage of everyone being able to hear our voices. At least we think it's a great advantage, but hopefully the public does too, at the instant that we're talking. Although, as you well know, even radio is beginning to migrate, not move from broadcasting, but spread out so that it's available through live streaming on the web. Indeed, you can communicate with us or participate in this discussion by using old media. You can call us at 800-433-8850. You can use old new media. You can communicate with us by sending an email to koju at wamu.org, or you can communicate with us by new new media by going to facebook.com slash kojo show or sending us a tweet at Kojo Show. We're talking with Paul Levinson. He is a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University and author most recently of New New Media. And we're talking about New New Media. Paul, allow me to make an observation. Huge changes are going on as we speak, but many of the shifts in our media landscape are hard to appreciate. Where are we now and where are we heading? We're in the first stage of a very profound revolution, and that almost sounds like a cliché. You hear the word revolution so often. Uh, But my study of media throughout history uh, and what it's taught me about what happened when the alphabet was first introduced, what happened when the printing press was first introduced, what happened when broadcasting was first introduced, we're seeing very similar things now with the advent of new, new media. As we were discussing, it's already had enormous political impact. It has impact on the way we watch television. Increasingly, people are watching television at times of their choosing, meaning they can see whatever show they want any time, regardless of whatever schedule it may have had on conventional old broadcast television. So we're at the beginning of this very profound series of changes. And before it's over, we are going to see a reduction in the number of newspapers, which is already happening. I'm not too upset about that. Because, in fact, I'm not upset about it at all. Why not? Because we can read the same material online. And here is one point where I might disagree with Marshall McLuhan. In, in the case of journalism, the message is uh, more important than the medium. And it doesn't matter whether we have the paper or the Washington Post that we physically hold in our hands or we log onto some system and read uh, the Washington Post that way. Not to mention that in the blogosphere, many of these stories are discussed in many less-known venues. We'll we'll also see a decline in viewership of network television, which has happened already. 
Again, that's no big deal either. Advertisers have already begun to shift from advertising in conventional television network formats to putting up ads on television shows that are on the web. And those ads are in many ways more effective because when you see an ad online, you can click on it and buy the product immediately, and that's what advertisers like. You mentioned several issues that I'd like to discuss. You mentioned Marshall McLuhan, who in the book New New Media you describe as the first micro-blogger with statements like the medium is the message, another one that would have made a great tweet. We're inviting our callers. If you can think of the great pearls of wisdom throughout the ages that you can reduce to a tweet, then you can send us such a tweet at Kojo Show. We'll read it later in the broadcast. Or you can send us a uh, 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 an email to kojo at wamu dot org if you have questions or comments on this discussion on new new media. I'd also like to get back to the point you made about newspapers. You say that doesn't bother you. Can bloggers really step into the breach being left by declining newspapers and other mainstream media? It has been made by. Uh, the point has been made by Jeff Jarvis, among others, that blogs are dependent on the hard investigating, investigative reporting of newspapers. What happens to things like investigative reporting? Well, several possibilities. The more money that blogs make, again, through advertising, not through charging readers, the more able they'll be to hire investigative journalists who can just as easily do this hard investigative journalism for a blog as they can for a newspaper. And if you think about how newspapers started, if you look at the New York Times back in the 1840s, in those days, it was a very new medium. Uh, people didn't have all that much confidence in it or in newspapers in general, and uh, it quickly established itself as an essential part of our intellectual lives. So this, again, gets back to what really counts in journalism. There's no doubt that blogging, as it is today, does rely on conventional newspapers, and Jeff Jarvis is 100% right about that. Bloggers are fundamentally today commentators, op-ed writers. They, they write opinion pieces, spin pieces, and, and so on, which are very important. But there's no reason at all that investigative journalism can't have a place in that same format. It's not as if new new media are allergic to hard news reporting. You say we sometimes are afflicted by a first love syndrome. If we grew up with newspapers, we think newspapers can and always should be a vibrant part of the media landscape. Yeah, I realized this uh, a few years ago, actually in much more specific uh, situations than in looking at m media, uh, but the, this, uh, the same principle does apply to all media. But you know how it is when a movie comes out that's based on a book, say the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy of movies versus the Lord of the Rings trilogy of books. Both have enormous audiences. I noticed a very interesting thing, though. For people who first read the books, although they may have loved the movies, they just didn't think the movies quite measured up. But yeah, for people who first saw this wonderful story on a motion picture screen, they thought the books maybe went into too much detail. And this is exactly the first love syndrome. The most extreme example I've ever seen of that, by the way, there are some people who think that the Star Trek movies are better than the original Star Trek television series, which to me is totally incredible. But then again, I'm suffering from that first love syndrome. <laughs> and it does apply to media. If you have grown up in an environment in which you get the news on your breakfast table in a, on a, in a newspaper format, although you might enjoy browsing the web and getting the news, it just doesn't feel completely comfortable and reliable. Uh, but for people who have not grown up that way, and these uh, obviously are people who are 5, 10, 15 years old, the web is perfectly natural. One thing, though, that I find very interesting is that Twitter, which you mentioned before, Twitter's demographic now, it's age demographic. It's getting older. Yeah, so uh, new new media, not just for kids anymore. 
If your first love is telephones, then you can join this conversation by calling us at 800-433-8850. If your first love is Twittering, then you can join the conversation at Kojo Show. Send us a tweet. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, we'll continue the conversation. It is about new, new media, that media which allow us to become both consumers and producers of media. We're talking with Paul Levinson. He's a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University and author of the book, New New Media. It's Tech Tuesday. I'm Kojo Nandi. It's a Tech Tuesday conversation about New New Media with Paul Levison, author most recently of the book of the same name, New New Media. He's a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. We got an email from DC in DC who says, generally old media don't die. They just have to grow old gracefully. Guess what? We still have stonemasons. They haven't been the primary purveyors of the written word for a while now, of course, but they still have a role because you wouldn't want a TV screen on your headstone. Who knows? Somebody might Paul. <laughs> well, that's a very sage that point. That is a quote, by the way, from Douglas Adams. Yeah, uh, that's a good quote. Uh, well, absolutely. As I was saying before, most of the time, old media do not die. In fact, uh, years ago, I came up with this concept of what I call the media ecological niche. And what that means is if a medium satisfies a human need, it then will survive regardless of what else happens, unless something comes along that satisfies that specific need much better. So if you think about radio, one of the reasons that radio is thriving in an age of television and audiovisual media is that it's perfect for multitasking, uh, which, of course, wasn't a word back in the 1920s and 40s and 50s, but you can drive a car and listen to the radio. If you drive a car and watch television, you probably won't get very far. <laughs> we got another email from Ross who says, The promise of new, new media is interesting, but I am burned out. It seems like people are becoming self-absorbed, self-promoters rather than producers of actual content. I'm curious what Mr. Levinson has to say about this. I'm young, and I'm concerned my peers are becoming idiots. Paul Levinson? Well, since I might be described as a vigorous self-promoter, uh, but I don't take any armbridge from that, I actually think <laughs> uh, that email does accurately describe one aspect of what people do on Twitter and via new new media. But the key point is that's not all that they do. And so on Twitter, for example, for every boring, self-absorbed tweet, you know, I'm standing online at Tony's Pizza, where's the pizza? I'm hungry already, I'm tired, oh, the car <laughs> drove, drove by, who cares? For every one of those, you have people in Iran, uh, protesters, telling the world about the government cracking down on them, police charging them, and with no other way for the world to find out about what was going on there. So like all media, new new media encompass the most banal, trivial aspects of humanity, but they also are a wonderful conduit of the most profound. You can send us your tweet at Kojo Show, especially if you can think of traditional pearls of wisdom that you can now break down to 140 characters or less. You can also call us at 800-433-8850. Most of us, Paul, are weary of information overload, but you say that the opposite is actually the problem, that there is too little information. Given how powerful these new apps are, the new new media, what is the information underload? Well, let's go back to a very old medium, the public library. Now, if you walk into a library, clearly there are vastly more books than you can possibly take out of the library, possibly even think about, right? I mean, there are thousands and thousands of volumes. But most of the time, we don't feel as if we're suffering from information overload in those circumstances, because ever since we've been little kids in school, we have been taught navigational tools. We know where the biographies are, where the fiction is, where the new books that are coming in will be shelved, where magazines are today, where computer stations are. All well, the Liberian isn't looking. We know all of this. That's exactly <laughs> right. Uh, and 
The problem, I think, that people are talking about when they say, oh, my God, there's too much information, I'm suffering from information overload, is that they don't have sufficient navigational information. And one of the reasons why Google became so successful is that it was one of the first to provide easy ways of navigating the web. And the easier that becomes, the more we can make sense out of all the information that's out there, make sense of it in terms of no where it is, when we want to use it, access it on our terms rather than the information's uh, terms. So the paucity of our navigational skills is the source of our information underload? Yes. And also I'd point out historically uh, the greatest problems have happened in human affairs, both personally and globally, when there was not enough information, not when there was too much information. One of my favorite really sad examples is the Battle of New Orleans was fought in New Orleans in the year 1814 after the peace treaty ending the War of 1812 had been signed in Paris. But they put news of that on a boat and it was wending its way across the rocky Atlantic and didn't get there in time to stop that battle. Information underload. Here is Sam in Washington, D.C. Sam, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Kojo. Uh, there was a comment that Mr. Levinson made about um, the new media depending on advertising rather than the readers to uh, you know, support itself. And um, I, I was a little concerned about that because, really, who, who, uh, who does the new media end up serving? Like, you know, sources like NPR, which are great sources – have corporate sponsors as well, but um, the reader is not, ex- or the, the 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 receiver of the information is not excluded from participating and and um, and being a part of the business. And so uh, there, there's some integrity left in, <laughs> and this, that's why NPR is one of my you know main sources of information because there's there's still that integrity remaining. If it's if it's exclusively a corporate sponsor of that information, then who does that information serve? Paul. Cool. I don't know a single blogger who has advertising on his or her site or a single podcaster who has uh, commercial advertising, and I include myself in this, but I know hundreds of other bloggers and podcasters whose content is in the slightest determined by the ad. Any more than the content of the New York Times is determined by its advertisers. Occasionally in old media, there have been cases in which advertisers have pressured editors to take stories out. One of the most infamous examples was Dorothy Schiff at the New York Post in the 1970s. She was pressured by supermarket advertisers to stop an expose on supermarkets. So I do agree that there is a potential danger. But so far, the evidence is that people who create their own blogs and podcasts, although they're happy enough to have advertising, the last thing in the world they would do is give up the very independence to these advertisers, which they're so happy to have on this blog or podcast. Sam, thank you very much for your call. We move on to Dina in College Park, Maryland. Dina, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, I would like to know how Professor Levinson views the First Amendment rights, like prior restraint and revealing sources, um, regarding new media, new new media bloggers and, and people who might not necessarily be quote unquote press or journalists. There was a recent case of a blogger getting in trouble in New York for slandering a model. I'm sure you read the story. Yeah. Well, first about the First Amendment, it is under attack. It's been under attack ever since the clear and present danger decision at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, We have a Supreme Court that has, by and large, with few exceptions, uh, decided against uh, First Amendment issues. And, in fact, uh, one of the things I was writing about recently is that Now Justice Sotomayor had a very unfortunate First Amendment decision uh, in the New York Circuit uh, Court regarding a high school student who was punished by her school officials because she wrote some offensive material on Avery Doninger. That's right, Avery Doninger on a on a private personal blog that she had, which of course was accessible to other people, but it wasn't a school blog. 
So to get to your question, the First Amendment is already in jeopardy uh, in this country, and therefore, unfortunately, it's not surprising that prosecutors, judges, the government in general is quick to try to extinguish whatever First Amendment rights bloggers and podcasters and video casters might have. My view is and a lot of First Amendment advocates share this view, and this gets back to what I was saying before, the medium is here, again, irrelevant. What counts is, is the person doing reporting? Is the person in the realm of ideas? And if that's the case, then the government has no more business trying to punish that person or bringing that person into court to reveal his or her sources than they do if the person is writing for the New York Times or any place else. Well, the government may not punish you, but, you know, when I first got involved in this industry, everything that was said went out over the airwaves and disappeared into the ether. One hallmark of new new media is that nothing, nothing disappears in the ether. So even if the government doesn't go after you, once that stuff is permanently out there, does that mean that despite the fact that you feel very strongly about our First Amendment rights, that we need to be careful about what we say when we say it? Well, if we're worried about uh, the government or anyone coming after us, we always needed to be careful. But it is true. Uh, I consider... Like future employers. Yes, well, that's absolutely <laughs> true. New new media are Velcro for everything that we say and do through them, meaning they stick and they can be seen and read and heard years after uh, we say them. Uh, there are still some things on the web, which I said back in the early and mid-1980s. Of course, I'm proud of everything I've ever said, so <laughs> I'm happy about that. But, you know, politicians uh, have found to their chagrin that they say something uh, at some kind of, you know, rally. Uh, you know, unlike Joe Wilson, where everyone saw that, so that wasn't the problem, uh, meaning he knew full well when he called the president uh, a liar that everyone was going to hear and see it. But other politicians are talking at some private rally and say something, and then that's... Uh, recorded forever. And, and yes, in that sense, the world has changed. And that happened to President Obama recently, having to do with the rapper Kanye West, but it was an off-the-record remark, so I won't repeat it here. Our guest is Paul Levinson. <laughs> His past works include Digital McLuhan and Cell Phone, the story of the world's most mobile medium and how it has transformed everything. He's also an award-winning science fiction writer. His latest work of fiction is The Plot to Save Socrates. He joins us in the studio for this Tech Tuesday to talk about new new media and his book of the same name. He's a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. If you have questions or comments, you can call us at 800-433-8850 or go to facebook.com slash Kojo Show. Here are a few of the tweets we got. This one says... An eye for an eye, and the world goes blind. That came from Gandhi. This one, we got a tweet from Fabulous Miss Jess, who says, My pithy tech quote, I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas J. Watson, circa 1943. And this tweet from Ian in D.C., Every new capability is a new crutch. The apps that give, also do they take away. Do they necessarily take away? No, not really. <laughs> it is true that we might become somewhat dependent on them, but but a key point about all this, and if anyone just thinks about it rationally, I don't see how they can deny it, is media aren't addictive in the sense that heroin and tobacco are addictive, meaning we can leave a new medium anytime we like. If, if we don't want to tweet anymore, we can stop it. If we don't want to use email, we can stop that. If we don't want to look at things on YouTube or produce YouTube uh, videos, we can stop that anytime. So calling it a crutch is a strange kind of appellation uh, since... Unless there's a miracle worker around, someone who has a crutch can't just throw the crutch away and walk away from it. Well, here's one of the points that tweet might be making. There's a strong sense that these new technologies might be shortening our attention spans, that maybe tweeting and Google and Wikipedia are making us, uh, well, stupid. 
What do you think? Is the era of Twitter making us more connected or is it shortening our attention spans? You can call us on that if you want to also, 800-433-8850. Here's Paul Levinson. Well, here's my fast off-the-cuff answer uh, with my short attention span. Human beings have always had short attention spans. We start out as infants with very short attention spans. We learn to have longer attention spans, but that thirst for a quick response, that tendency to want to move on from one thing to another never thoroughly leaves us. But you know, it's interesting. People are always unhappy and distrustful about new, new media. I remember back in the 70s and 80s, uh, academics were wringing their hands that we're becoming illiterate because we were watching so much television. And they, they wrote articles about it. People read those articles and discussed it. Apparently, those people were still literate. But then when texting came along, I wrote a little piece saying, see that? We're not illiterate. We're texting. And then some of these academics said, yeah, but look at the language that's used in texting. It's barely literate. Well, what does it matter you know, how something is spelled if it's communicating a word? And I think the same is true with Twitter. It's not making us less literate. It's not making us have shorter attention spans. We already have a capacity for short and long attention spans. Twitter caters to the short attention span, no doubt about that. But a blog of a thousand words caters to a longer attention span. I guess Twitter is not where the individual who's trying to learn how to write a novel tries to learn to start writing. You write about a theorist named Lewis Mumford who bemoaned the rise of broadcast TV and radio precisely because you could only take in information in a unidirectional way. Now in the era of TiVo, YouTube, and you can cut back and forward... Do you feel that we can actually get a better understanding of what's going on? Yes. I think that Mumford, although he was a little extreme, uh, mm-hmm. did have a strong thread of accurate criticism when he talked about this one-way flood of information, uh, which is still useful. And that's why I don't agree with him completely. But it's much better when people can engage in dialogue, can question the information. Socrates, according to Plato, uh, in the Phaedrus, bemoaned the advent of the written word because, according to Socrates, the written word gives but one unvarying answer. And Socrates yearned for an intelligent writing. That's Benjamin Jowett's uh, translation of the original Greek, an intelligent writing. Well, Twitter is an intelligent writing by Socratic terms because you can engage in dialogue through Twitters or on Facebook commentary or many other places. It's not unidirectional. Here is Brian in Triangle, Virginia. Brian, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, I'd like to take a couple steps back uh, regarding your uh, caller who mentioned about uh, how media outlets may be beholden to sponsors um, and, you know, question the potential integrity of the reporting and the journalism. But what about the owners of the single owners of huge media conglomerates who uh, essentially can set editorial policy to, you know, control out of the big bucket of facts what people hear and see and then is thus reported. How, in your opinion, how does that affect the integrity of journalism? I think that's a potential uh, and very real problem. Kojo mentioned uh, a few minutes ago the case in New York. There was a blogger who was saying some nasty things about a model, and the blog was on Google, and a judge ordered Google to reveal the blogger's name. And I would have liked to have seen Google say to the judge, no, we're not. And let's literally make a federal case out of this. But Google did reveal the blogger's identity. This, I think, is disquieting because it shows that however free a blog may be, if it's on Blogspot, Google still ultimately can pull the plug on it. And every podcast that exists is hosted on some system. On the other hand, I think the weight of our cultural evolution is moving so powerfully into uh, the abhorrence of any central system trying to regulate what's going on that I suspect these titans such as Google will be very careful 
in trying to uh, regulate these things. But it is still a problem. I'm sure you may have heard that Amazon about a month ago, uh, basically because they were informed that legally they didn't have the right to put uh, George Orwell's 1984 out on their Kindle. So Amazon said, yeah, oh, we're sorry, you're right. <laughs> what they did is they, they basically, with one stroke, removed all the copies of 1984 from everyone's Kindle. The people were reimbursed, but a, a few students lost notes. I can't think of a better example of 1984 and Big Brother than what Amazon did. So we have to be vigilant. But so far, those cases are the exception to the rule. 1984 and 2009. I'd like to share a few tweets before we go to our next break. This one comes from Ray Daly. Bloggers already do better jobs than newspapers in many small towns. This one from our friend Matthew Felling in Anchorage, Alaska. You'll remember Matthew used to fill in on this show from time to time. Matthew says it's 135 characters, conflicted, instant ubiquitous connections with only the most basic or misleading info conveyed, the soundbite society on steroids. This tweet from R.K. Blackman, Twitter's metaphor is fortuitous. The flock versus the single information source best describes the power and peril of the Internet. This one from Kaleeb One, I will always enjoy holding and reading a newspaper no matter what the new new media promises us. And this tweet from Acorn Dreaming, I polled my two college English classes, 48 freshmen, not one uses Twitter. Is that credible to you? Well, again, it, it is true that Twitter is m more frequently used by people in their 30s and 40s, so ah, presumably yes. there are no people that age in that classroom, but I don't quite believe it either. We're going to take a short break. Some of those students might not be telling the whole truth. Paul Levinson is a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University and author most recently of New New Media, which is the topic for this Tech Tuesday. You can call us 800-433-8850 or shoot us an email to kojo at wamu.org. I'm Kojo Nandi. It's Tech Tuesday, and we're discussing new, new media with the author of the book of the same name, New New Media. Paul Levinson is a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. Paul, you have written an entire book about how one piece of technology, the cell phone, is transforming our culture. This is a piece of hardware, not software. Well, hardware by itself does nothing. I mean, think about a television set without any television on it. It's basically what? I don't know. Maybe you could use it sort of as a mirror or a place to put plants. So cell, the cell phone is, sure, it's a physical piece of equipment, but it's what that equipment does, allowing us to talk to anyone, any place, anytime we want, anytime the receiver may want to. And now, with iPhones and Blackberries, you can get on the web instantly, you can see YouTube videos, all of these new new media that we've been talking about are now accessible through essentially cell phones, which has made it portable. And that's a very significant development as well. You call it the end of useless places, that mobile technology is transforming free time by making doing nothing have to be a conscious choice. Exactly. Uh, think about being in an elevator or actually stuck in an elevator, and what are you going to do? I mean, unless you really like the people who are stuck in there with you, that's not going to be a very good experience. Or let's say you're stuck in there alone. Well, if you have a cell phone or an iPhone or a BlackBerry, it doesn't matter if you're in the elevator. It doesn't matter whether you're in Central Park, in an elevator, at the Smithsonian here in Washington. Place becomes irrelevant. And if the place is otherwise useless to you, it becomes instantly useful. But that doesn't mean that we always have to be on and connected because we can shut these devices off anytime we want to be in a useless place. And that's good because we're choosing to do it rather than it being imposed upon us. Back to the telephones. Here is Eric in Herndon, Virginia. Eric, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi. I was wondering if uh, you could speak to the difference between uh, data and, and information that um, obviously trained journalists 
of a quality of information that they're reporting as opposed to uh, just data necessarily that comes through. And have you seen uh, any any training that uh, is available for bloggers uh, to be able to report back in an intelligent format? Well, the same journalism courses that some journalists have taken are available for bloggers. And at the same time, there are many great reporters who never had a, a journalism course. I mean, Edward R. Murrow didn't go to journalism school. Uh, neither did Peter Jennings. So the fact of the matter is, as I was saying before, whatever training, whatever expertise we may want in those who report the news to us is just as available to bloggers as it is to uh, newspaper reporters. The only difference is, and I do agree that it is a difference, is that a newspaper hires a reporter. And so in that way, there's a sort of top-down vetting of the reporter's capabilities, whereas a blogger puts up text on his or her own. You see this very clearly in, say, Wikipedia versus the Encyclopedia Britannica. The Encyclopedia Britannica carefully vets all of its contributors, makes sure the articles are correct. On Wikipedia, anyone can write just about anything. Uh, but, you know, a very interesting study was done a few years ago by Nature magazine, and much to everyone's surprise, that study found that the level of error was virtually the same in Wikipedia and the Encyclopedia Britannica, which shows that this more democratic uh, way of getting information works. Even though Wikipedia now says that it's going to be hiring more editors to vet some of the information that appears on Wikipedia. So despite the fact that there was no difference between error rate on the Britannica Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica, and Wikipedia, Wikipedia still seems to feel a need for greater accuracy. Yeah, I think that's unfortunate. It actually came, well, it's been brewing for a long time, but it, but it was really brought to a head when, after Obama's inauguration at the inaugural luncheon, Ted Kennedy and Robert Byrd were rushed to the hospital. And uh, Wikipedia reported for a very, very brief period of time that Senator Ted Kennedy had died then. It was very quickly corrected because a lot of people saw it and saw that that was not the case. And this got Jimmy Wells, who is one of the founders of Wikipedia, even more focused on this vetting of information. Uh, but I personally think it's a mistake because the more you have an expert vet the more that gets in the way of an authentic, valuable piece of information that the expert may not be aware of. So it's a trade-off. And I think Wikipedia has been an enormously important development precisely because it has not gone the vetting route. Thank you very much for your call, Eric. Let me read to you a couple of emails on that same on the issue of blogs versus newspapers or mainstream media. I think that a, this, this one comes from Jim in Columbia. I think that a distributed army of new media producers, whether bloggers, tweeters, or via Facebook, will always beat our beat reporters or bureaus because of sheer numbers. If you look at the most recent current events broken by people on the ground, most notably the Iran post-vote conflicts, it was new, new media and not old. This one from Greg, mainstream news outlets don't do the hard investigative journalism that Kojo is talking about. The blogs do that now. Establishment news more often than not provides protection for our nation's leaders and blogs do the real checking and balancing. What do you think about that, Paul Levinson? I don't agree with it completely. I think there is still a lot of good reporting via old traditional media. However, with one extremely significant and egregious exception, in the build-up to the war in Iraq, the traditional mass media pretty much just blindly accepted what the Bush administration was saying about Saddam Hussein having weapons of mass destruction. And there were a few bloggers who were disagreeing with it. And in fact, the daily costs first became prominent uh, in response to that shortfalling of our traditional media. Uh, so if we would add up, say, over the last eight or nine years, the reporting in mainstream versus uh, new new media, and you would take the buildup to the Iraq war out of it, 
uh, mainstream media don't do that badly. But when you consider their failure with the buildup to the war in Iraq and their poor reporting on that, I would agree with your caller. Well, we have a very long email from Melissa on this issue, which will probably take a while, but I think it's important enough to share with you. Professor Levinson, Melissa writes, is woefully wrong to believe that newspaper reporting of the caliber that newspaper readers have come to expect is seamlessly moving to the Internet. Newspapers are moving to the Internet, no doubt, but in so doing, they are losing bodies, relaxing standards, shifting to a definition of news that is entirely dictated by public consumption standards and going broke in the process. As greatly reduced reporting staff spend more of their work hours blogging, they write more pap, more snark, and less substance. The form in which newspapers' websites present substantive reporting is very much dictated by the expectations of those who consume their news on a computer. It must be short and colorful to the point of distraction. It will receive little editing since editors have been swept away with the tide. It must be turned around on a dime, presented instantaneously, thereby assuring it will have no depth and increasingly will be written by reporters who can't spell and have no exposure to the traditions of objective journalism such as fact-checking. Well... Take it from a newspaper reporter hanging on to a job, she says. By the time we realize we're being fed a diet of crap instead of news, those capable of reporting facts accurately and objectively on the Internet or in paper will be long gone. Your turn, Paul. Well, clearly Melissa isn't afflicted by this thirst for the short form that we were talking about. (laughs) Uh, I understand her passion and her concern, but I think that she overlooks history. For example, take uh, USA Today. You know, that started as a newspaper that was trying to mimic television reporting in the form of a newspaper. And that quickly became the most successful newspaper in many ways in American history. Today, it still has the highest circulation, over 2 million. That was way, way before blogging, before new, new media, before new media. And, you know, when I was in school... The New York Times was very different from the way it is today, but even the way it was 10, 15, 20 years ago, there were numerous follow-up stories. You could really learn an enormous amount uh, about any issue that the New York Times was covering on the front page because there'd be in-depth reporting in the actual paper. But I remember uh, talking to my wife uh, in the late 1980s and early 1990s about the New York Times having become a shell of of its former self. So you can't blame that on blogging and new, new media. On to Howard in Chevy Chase, Maryland. Howard, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hi, Howard. You're on the air. Okay, I've got two things. Uh, One one, uh, one line that you were asking for before... uh, you know, things that could be put in 104 sure. characters that I like, but I won't give you the name of the author because I don't like him. But it's simply uh, for every complex problem, there's a simple answer, and it's always wrong. Yeah, I know who that is. You know who that is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so that that's, uh, I think it's, but it, I think it has a lot of uh, common sense in it. Okay, next. The second thing is, uh, it was interesting that our granddaughter, who's now 12, has a three-month project to explore and do research on three inventions of the uh, basically the 20th century, which have affected us. Uh, but the key thing is that she is prohibited from using Wikipedia. And I wonder if that's a good thing or why could, that couldn't be just used and then uh, as one of many sources and then uh, uh, if it's not correct, then we, she should I, identify that. Here's Paul. She has lazy teachers because uh, a worthwhile teacher should be able to tell if a quoted fact is incorrect. And prohibiting a student from using an online source for whatever reason uh, is it, it, just totally counterproductive. It, it reminds me of uh, apropos Marshall McLuhan that in the 1980s uh, I came across several Ph.D. programs which officially refused to let students use McLuhan as a source 
I mean, it's it's totally preposterous. And obviously, Wikipedia is not a person. It's uh, it's an online encyclopedia. But that same kind of thing applies. Prejudging something as not worthwhile makes no sense. What was at the all. rationale for not losing using McLuhan as a source? Because he didn't do proper research. He was talking off the top of his head. He was doing what we are today identifying as tweeting by communicating in aphorisms rather than long, boring, scholarly discourses. Howard, thank you for your call. Speaking of tweeting, before we go, just a couple I'd like to share with you. This one from Gern Les. Disconnected neighbors are strangers offline. Online sharing builds community spirit among com- around common interests. And this one from C.N. Davis. To tech or not tech is never a question, but rather how and where do you tech? In the home, via phone, Zoom, or wherever you go. New New Media. Paul Levinson is the author of the book New New Media. He's a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. Paul, good to see you again. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure as always, Kojo. And thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Nandi. The Light on Light Through podcast And Paul Levinson back here with you on the Light On, Light Through podcast. I'll try to talk a little more softly because you notice how those NPR interviews, they're very soft-spoken. Maybe that's better than some of the hypey way in which I usually talk. But I do hope you enjoyed and found useful that interview from September 2009 in which Kojo Namdi interviewed me on his NPR radio show. And I'll be back here soon with another episode of Light On, Light Through. In the meantime, enjoy.